to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel the of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of and Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 29. Welcome to our study of the Old Testament book of 1 Chronicles. These lessons, as we think about the Old Testament and its importance in our lives today, I'm reminded of Romans 15, 4. The scripture says, the things that were written before time, no doubt a reference to the old law, were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might find hope. The Old Testament was specifically given to the people of Israel, but it also applies to us in that I can learn about God, about Jesus, about how to relate to the Father, and I can learn the type of faith and actions that are either pleasing or displeasing to God. And so, as we study 1 Chronicles, we want to learn some key ideas, gain a little background knowledge to the book, but as much as anything, we want to take these Old Testament books and apply their living messages to our lives today so that we can truly be faithful until death. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. Now, what's 1 Chronicles all about? Well, in Hebrew history, 1 Chronicles really takes us from Adam, point of creation, all the way to Solomon. He begins by backtracking all the way back in the genealogies to Adam. He traces those genealogies in the first nine chapters, bringing us up to David and to Solomon eventually to show the continual working of God through His people to accomplish His purposes. Now, in reality, 1 Chronicles is mainly about the righteous and godly reign of King David how that David was a good man, how that he tried to worship and live his life, and as the greatest king of Israel, save the Lord Jesus, king of the church today, he is a type of the Christ in many ways who was to come. Now, some of the key words in 1 Chronicles are the word worship or praise. David is helping the people to see that God is worthy not just of living for, but worthy of honor, and praise and that they truly need to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. As we mentioned, I think one of the key verses is found in 1 Chronicles 16 verse 29. Notice this passage. David says, Give to the Lord the glory due His name, bring an offering and come before Him, O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. When we talk about God and our relationship to Him, I need to give God the, the glory He deserves. God deserves all glory in my life and yours. You ever wonder and ask the, one of the most important questions man's ever asked, why am I here? Well, let's let God tell us. Isaiah 43 verse 7, God says, everyone who's called by my name, listen to these words, whom I created for my glory. God says, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. Why were you formed? Why was I created? I was created, and so were you, to glorify God. Give unto the Lord the glory do His name. What's that mean? Let my life be a, a glorification to God. Everything I say, everything I do, needs to bring honor to the name of God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, Whether we eat or whether we drink or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. Oh, how our life needs to bring honor to the Almighty. And then he says, bring an offering. Come before Him with praise. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Have you ever thought about how beautiful holiness is? How that it's something that is attractive, endearing, and that ought to draw men to God? Well, God's the greatest example 
of holiness and I need to worship and praise Him in that holiness. Now, there's a key prophecy and in some of these books we've, books we've pointed these out. In 1 Chronicles 17 verses 11 through 14, the prophecy is made that one of the seed of David would reign on the throne of David and that he would set up a kingdom which would never be destroyed. A lot of people thought that was the kingdom of Solomon. But I know ultimately it wasn't. Although Solomon was a great king in many ways, reigned in David's place, perpetuated the kingdom of Israel, Israel was ultimately destroyed. And that kingdom is really no more. Well, who was God talking about? Luke 1, verse 32 and 33, In prophecy to Mary it is said, And you will call His name Jesus. He will save His people from their sin. He will reign over the house of David and of His kingdom. There will be no end. Jesus is from the house of David. Matthew 1, verses 14 following. Jesus and His kingdom is still reigning and ruling today. Revelation 11, 14. He's still King of all kings and Lord of all lords. And so this great prophecy really points us forward to Jesus and God working through Him to bring His message about. Now, just kind of an outline of the book to help us understand maybe the ideas in 1 Chronicles. Chapters 1 through 9 are the genealogies from Adam to David, kind of a, an accounting of the great figures in the history of Israel, and to show ultimately that Jesus did have the right, coming through David, to be king, would be proved to the Jews on the day of Pentecost and in other places. And then in chapters 10 through 29, we find about the death of Saul and how David begins to reign over the United Kingdom. And really the book from that point forward begins to show us the good works, the good heart, and how we ought to try our best in every way to follow the good example of King David. Now, we see Saul's ultimate failure in chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. Listen to what God says about King Saul and why he was ultimately removed as king. Chapter 10, verse 13, the Bible says, So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord, and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord, therefore he, God, killed him, and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. Saul had great potential. He started out with good ideas, but what happened? Sin began to reign in his life. Sin took a hold of this man, and, and the Bible says he died for his unfaithfulness, even to the point, instead of going and asking God for advice, he went and asked the witch of Endor what to do in a certain situation, trying to eventually use her to get God's message, but that's the way he resorted to. That's how low saw God. And so he died for his unfaithfulness and his sin against the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord. He ultimately consulted a medium. And just as importantly, just as important, he did not inquire of God to do right and to find out what was right in the sight of God. Now, I want to share with you a key in the book of 1 Chronicles that I think is one of the most important keys in understanding and knowing how to interpret the Bible correctly. Would you open your Bible to 1 Chronicles chapter 15? And I don't want you to miss this passage. You might want to underline this in your own copy of the Bible. Look in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, and here's the context. The Israelites are transporting the ark of God back. Two men, Uzzah and Ahio, are transporting the ark. They come to a piece of ground called Nashon's threshing floor. And on this plot of ground, evidently the new cart that they've got this ark on, it, it hits a bump and it looks like the ark is about to fall off. And so Uzzah, who no doubt loves God and no doubt respects the ark out of love for God, he reaches up to stabilize that ark and he drops dead right there on the spot. Why did that happen? David didn't know. In fact, the context tells us he got angry about the event. But later, he went back and thought about it, and he gave us this great jewel of understanding and applying the Bible. Look in your Bible in 1 Chronicles 15 concerning this same event. David says, For because you did not do it the first time, 
the Lord our God broke out against us, don't miss this, because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. Now watch how they do it correctly. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. If you will study the book of Numbers, even some in the book of Exodus, you will find that God specified who was to carry the ark. He said the Levites were, and then he specified a little further. Inside the tribe of the Levites, only the sons of Kohath. And when they carried the ark, they were to put rods through the rings on the side of the ark, and they were to carry it on their shoulders, two men in the front, two men in the back. That's God's way of transporting it. And so what happened when the ark fell and Uzzah died? Notice verse 13 again. God, David said, these things happened because we did not consult him about the proper order. Friend, how today we need to take those words to heart when it comes to worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness, what's the right way and what's not the right way? Friend, there are a lot of folks who've got a lot of ideas today and those ideas, do they consult God about the right order? When it comes to things like women preaching, becoming real popular today, you might walk into a supposedly a place of worship in the United States of America and it might be the case that either a man or a woman might be standing up there preaching. Well, let's ask, have we consulted God about the proper order on that? Not according to 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 and 12. Paul said, let a woman learn in all silence with submission and I do not permit a woman to teach or be an authority over a man but to remain in silence. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 34 says the same thing and so here you've got man's idea. Here you've got man's order and man says let's put a woman up there and let her preach. What does God say? I do not permit a woman to teach or be an authority over a man. And so like in the days of David, let's consult God about the proper order on worshiping Him. What about when it relates to the Lord's Supper? You know, the Lord's Supper is a very special event. Jesus instituted it in Matthew 26 at the Passover. Jesus took that fruit of the vine and He took that unleavened bread and He said, this is my blood, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. And how did the church in the New Testament do that? Did they do it on Christmas? Did they do it on Easter? Did they do it on the first Sunday of every month? Well, let's see what their pattern was. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, the Bible says, On the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. Well, how did the New Testament church worship God concerning the Lord's Supper? Wasn't on Christmas, wasn't on Easter, wasn't the first Sunday of every month. They came together on the first day of the week. What week? There's no specific week in mind and thus every first day of the week. You know, it's really inconsistent when we say, well, that's hard to understand. Well, it's really not, and here's how. 1 Corinthians 16, the Bible says that we are to give as we have prospered on the first day of the week. Same language of Acts 20, verse 7. Now, how many places where you live don't take up a collection every first day of the week? Well, every place does. The language is similar to that of Acts 20 verse 7 and yet we understand it in 1 Corinthians 16 when it comes to giving but we're baffled when it comes to Acts 20 verse 7. Friend that shows inconsistency and more importantly are we really consulting God about the proper order? Let's consult God about another matter of worship. What about singing? Oh God has commanded singing and it's a wonderful part of our worship to Him. The Bible says if any man's happy let him sing. James 5 verse 13. The Bible teaches that the church is to praise God in song. Ephesians 5 19. We're to sing and make melody to the Lord. But how do we do that? And what's the proper order for worship? Is it okay to have a 10-piece rock band on the stage? Is it okay to strum a guitar or play a piano or, or play on a flute to the Lord? Is that what God's asked for? What's the proper order? That's what really matters. Well, let's hear what God says on the matter. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, 
Paul says, I will pray with the Spirit and I'll pray with the understanding. I will also sing with the Spirit and with the understanding. Singing identifies that we are to understand, correct singing means that we do it with our spirit, our whole heart, soul, mind, and body, and with our understanding. And thus, our emotion is involved with the words of the song, and we think about it as we sing. Now let's direct our attention to another passage that teaches us the proper order for singing. Look in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. The Bible says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. What is it God has asked for? God said, speak. God said, sing to one another. That's reciprocal. We all sing to each other. We praise God. We teach one another through the singing. Well, what am I to sing? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. That's what God, that's what God has identified. How am I to do that? Well, I'm to sing, and notice these words, and make melody where? On a piano? No, that isn't what it says. On a guitar? No, the Bible doesn't say that. O on a drum? No, God doesn't say that either. Where am I to make melody at? And make melody in your heart. That's not the blood pump. The heart's the mind. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You think in your heart, and thus the heart is the mind. Proverbs 23 and verse 7, And thus when I sing, I am to make melody, but where am I to make it? In my heart. How? I'll sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding. That's what God's asked for. And so, what about all these other things? What about instr mechanical instruments of music? What about a drum or a guitar or a piano? Well, let's ask us. Uzzah, how well did it fare for you when you touched the ark? There lies his dead body. It isn't hard to tell. It didn't work out very well for Uzzah. What did Uzzah do wrong? They didn't consult God about the proper order. How serious is it that we consult God about how he wants to be worshipped and praised? Remember Leviticus 10 verses 1 and 2. Two priests by the names of Nadab and Abihu. These priests are working in the sacrifice of God. And the Bible tells us, on this certain occasion, they offered a profane or unauthorized fire before the Lord, listen, which He had not commanded them. Fire rained down from heaven and devoured those men, and they died before the Lord. Sons of Aaron, who had the right to be priests, offered a strange or unauthorized fire to God. God didn't ask for it. They did it anyway. There lie their charred bodies. Didn't work out too well for them either. Friend, what I learned from these two examples is all God wants of me and you, of us, is to do what He says. God doesn't need my additions and your additions and man's inventions. God simply needs us to submit to His will. Well, let's learn, a, learn another lesson from 1 Chronicles. And this is a lesson about thanksgiving. Look in your Bible. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16, I want you to notice what is said in verse 34. Here's such a practical principle. The Bible says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. When I think about practical lessons from this book, I'm reminded from the example of David here, how that I ought to be a, a person of thanksgiving. Are we really a thankful people? The Bible says in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. We're to do everything in the name of the Lord with thanksgiving. Colossians 3 verse 17. And do you remember that story of the ten lepers? Luke chapter 17 beginning in verse 11. Ten lepers came to Jesus. Jesus healed all ten of them. One man came back to give God the glory and to say thank you. And do you remember the haunting question of Jesus? Where are the nine? What did Jesus say from that? In essence, He teaches us that I need to be thankful to God. You see, my friend, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there's no shadow or variation of turning. James 1.17, God has taken care of each of us. He's blessed us with much. And thus we need to be thankful to the Almighty for all that He does for us 
in this life. You know, when I think about practical lessons from 2 Chronicles, I'm reminded of a very practical lesson about sin from David's own life in 2 Chronicles or 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles 21, and I want you to notice what is said in verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, And God was displeased with this thing, David numbering the people. Therefore he struck Israel. So David said to God, look at his attitude. I've sinned greatly because I've done this thing, but now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Now, how did David feel about sin? Did David say, oh, sin's no big deal? Did David say somebody somewhere sinned? No, David said, I've sinned. I've done foolishly. I've transgressed the law of God. And then he said, I'm praying to you that you'll remove this sin from my life. What's the proper response to sin? The proper response to sin is to acknowledge it. David said it. I sinned. Achan said it. I've sinned. Saul said it. I've sinned. Judas said it. Went out and hanged himself. I've sinned. I need to have the proper response to sin and say, yes, I've sinned. I need to own up to what I've done. I need to be willing to confess it. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. 1 John 1, verses 7 through 10. I need to have the mindset of I'm ready to repent of it when I do recognize and confess it. Do you remember Acts chapter 8? Simon the sorcerer sees the gift of the Holy Spirit and he offers the apostles money. Peter says to him, your heart's not right in this matter. You've got neither part nor portion. You need to pray to God that the evil thought of your heart, you need to repent and pray that the evil thought of your heart might be forgiven you. I need an attitude of repentance that I have done wrong. And yes, I know it's wrong. I'm owning up to it and I'm ready to make it right. And then I need to learn from sin. I need to learn not to do those things again. I need to let sin that I've been involved in, the things I've done wrong, I need to let those teach me, hey, this is not the path you want to go down. For the Bible says, the way of the transgressor is hard. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 15. And so David had the right attitude about sin in his own life. Well, you know, when we talk about attitudes, let's look at an attitude that God wants men and women to have today. Look in 1 Chronicles chapter 22 and notice what is said in verse number 19. Here's the attitude that I need to have. Here's something David commands his people. He says, now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. He then says, therefore arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord and bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and holy articles of God into the house that is to be built for the name of the Lord. What's my attitude and mindset need to be? Set your heart to seek the Lord your God. Friend, I need the attitude of whatever God wants me to do. I'm ready to do it. You know, I can think of several people like that in the Bible. We mentioned Samuel. God spoke to the young man Samuel. And God said to him, Samuel. And he said, here am I. Speak. Speak, Lord. Your servant hears. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 6. God, Isaiah was in the presence of God. And Isaiah said, speak, Lord. Your servant hears. And how I need that same mindset. I want to hear what God says and I want to seek the Lord with all my heart. You know, that's what Jesus taught us, isn't it? Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. God wants me to put Him first before everything else in my life. That means my whole, soul, my whole soul, heart, mind, and strength will be given in the cause of Christ. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And then another lesson that we want to learn from the book of 1 Chronicles, and this is really a great question for all mankind that is asked. Look at 1 Chronicles 29 and notice the question that is asked in verse, verse 5. The Bible says the gold for the things of gold and the silver for the things of silver. This is consecrating things to the temple and for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of craftsmen. And then this question is asked, Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? Well, what does it mean to consecrate yourself? Who then is willing to set himself aside? 
Who then is willing to take his life and make it specially usable for the purpose of God? Will you consecrate your life to the cause of God? Will you set yourself apart? That means to be different and unique. Will you set yourself apart for service to God? Friend, there are a lot of people who are going down the wrong road. Jesus said the majority are headed down the road that leads to destruction. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Will you be different than the crowd? Will you make decisions that not everybody else is making? Will you set your life apart in service to Almighty God? What a haunting question and what a compelling question that is. And, and based on all that God has done for me and you, how we ought to be willing to set ourselves apart for Him. I'm mindful of the words of Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, where Paul said, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, listen to this, which is your reasonable service. What's that mean? In view of all that God's done for me. It's only reasonable. It only makes sense that I give myself as a living sacrifice to God every day. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? What do you mean I'm not my own? You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. If, if I'm a child of God, if Jesus paid the ultimate debt for my sin by His precious blood, then how should I live? Not as my own, but live for God every day. Friend, are you a child of God? Have you heard God's Word? Believed in Jesus? Repented of your sin? And have you been immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts 2 verse 38. As a Christian, have you really made up your mind to set yourself apart and be unique from the crowd? Our prayer and our hope today is that each of us will leave with a zeal and a desire to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, like not your one. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the gospel of Christ.